and thank all of you for being here today for what promises to be an important and I think critical conversation. Uh, we're going to try and have as much time for questions as possible. So I will start, kick off, and then uh, ask for a show of hands. Um, I wanted to start by asking some of you in the audience. I mean, would you mind raising your hand if you've dealt with any of the following in the, in the recent past? Burnout, grief, the loss of a loved one. Anyone? You know, and, and then the list goes on and on. Thank you so much. I, thank you. And, and me. <laughs> So I, I wanted to start by asking our esteemed panel a little bit about their personal journeys. So um, everyone here, of course, um, is in the mental health space, career-wise, but there's always the story behind the story. And I'm going to kick off with Neha Kirpal, who just as an uh, anecdote and detour, it seems, set up the India Art Fair, which is going on as we speak in Delhi, overlapping with the Jaipur Lit Fest, sold it, hugely successful and has made this foray into mental health. And, and she's had this really interesting journey. Um, Neha, you've spoken a little bit about your personal connect to this world, this space. Can you share a little bit with our audience? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amrita. And also, uh, it's wonderful to celebrate uh, literature and art in the same week. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be, be at both. Uh, so for me, the, the, the art fair uh, st started off as a bit of an experiment. Uh, but really, a few years out, I realized that there was a, a deeper calling and a sense of commitment to try and do something in a, in a space that has immensely touched our life as a family and all my years growing up. So for, for uh, forever, since I can remember, uh, our families dealt with extreme mental health conditions. My mother suffered for many years uh, with schizophrenia and uh, debilitated us and broke our family in many, many ways. And it took us a long time to recover from that. And yet today, uh, you know, my daughter is here in the audience and her nanny uh, lives with us and they enjoy uh, a wonderful uh, sort of a grandparent relationship only because uh, 25 years later she was able to get some kind of care and treatment and support. And it, it just kind of got me thinking about how many people have spent how many years trying to fix it and trying to find the help that they need and the support that they need and how hard it is to be able to navigate that path first within and then in the world at large. Uh, and so that's what inspired uh, my uh, journey with Amaha, which is a mental health organization. And we now work across 600 cities um, and we have centers in Delhi, Mumbai and Bangalore. And the idea really is to say, if there is any family out there that is looking to get help, how can we make that uh, easier for them to access, more affordable for them to access, and is there a way that we can just personalize that journey? So we're not trying to fix them, but we're trying to fix the community at large so that we can support each other in a better way. So that's really my inspiration to be here today. It's amazing. And 18 languages, you said. You all are working in um, across the spectrum um, uh, linguistically as well. Dr. Sen is, you know, a very well-renowned child and adolescent psychiatrist who I've been interviewing since I was, I think, a baby reporter <laughs> like 20 years ago. Um, he also really kindly agreed to do the forward to our book, Young Mental Health. And it's only the second time, uh, Dr. Sen, I heard a little bit about your personal story because, of course, I've seen the professional um, side of your, your career. Do you want to share a little bit about what drew you to this field and if you want to share a bit of your personal story Yeah, as well? yeah, sure. Oh, sure, Amrita. Thank you. Um, so I, I think my brush with uh, mental health challenges, or brushes perhaps, started quite early. Perhaps from the time I was a toddler. I was an extremely energetic toddler uh, of a kind who are said to be um, high maintenance, you know. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've heard many stories from my mother and other people as to how they had to do all kinds of innovative things like tie me to the dining table with a sari and, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and have to kind of um, chase me down staircases whenever I would get a chance, I would kind of try to get away from home and um, put my hand in a, you know, beehive or something like that. So it was indeed uh, uh, challenging for my mother uh, and she would tell these stories with a degree of amusement. But it didn't remain amusing after a while once I got into school and soon I started realizing that there are expectations and there are expectations from all quarters, from teachers, from parents. And uh, as early as when I was uh, in class two, um, I remember feeling this deep sense of inadequacy because I could not do what was expected of me. I couldn't complete my classwork. I 
couldn't, uh, for the life of me, finish homework and take it back to school. And gradually that started impacting the sense of self. And by the time I was in middle school, um, I had started stammering. And while I was boisterous and, uh, and playful in, at home or uh, out there in, in the playground, in the classroom I was like a little mouse. I could barely speak. And I, I was indeed like a, you know, like, uh, you know, kids these days would uh, talk about them being invisible in classes or being like ghosts. There's one young man who said that I, I feel like a ghost. People look through me. And I felt like that. I remember very clearly that in high school, ninth and 10th, my class teacher would ask questions to different students. And when she came to me, she would just skip me and go to the next. Because she did not, she, uh, you know, I, I, uh, she perhaps knew that I would not be able to respond. I don't know out of um, whether she did it out of kindness or whether she just had given up on me by then, you know. So uh, there was this deep-seated guilt and self-deprecation that was growing alongside. And uh, around senior school, I also started experiencing pangs of uh, anxiety in the pit of my stomach, and which kind of, you know, carried on for perhaps the next two decades. And I think I grew up, although uh, outwardly, you know, uh, seemingly confident and, uh, you know, um, out there with people. I, I'm, a lot of people thought I was an extrovert, but I, I had a hard time to deal with some of my inner demons, and it took me at least a couple of decades to be able to sort them out. Uh, it's, perhaps it's a, you know, with, with forces that I did not understand myself, that I gravitated towards uh, psychiatry as a specialization. And when I started seeing children in that space, I realized how many of those kids are, uh, almost mirroring some of the things that I had gone through. And, and because I had gone through it myself, uh, it, it struck me that how the world around them, you know, responds to them with the interpretation, the criticism, the judgment, and making them seem like single-storied people or children, like, you know, an, an autistic child or, you know, a schizophrenic mother or something like that, you know, uh, where it, it's as if nothing else exists in their life except that one mental health diagnosis. And that's what I started off by wanting to solve because I had faced it myself and I thought that this is perhaps one thing that we need to look at is to, it's to how to, um, you know, address the problem-saturated narratives that children, young people grow up with? And, and what are the things that we need to do to make their storied, uh, stories multi-storied, you know, or, or uh, give, you know, help them develop or um, start believing in richer narratives about themselves? And so a large part of our work in Children First and the organization, uh, organizations that we worked with is to do with building communities and spaces where uh, kids, families, they are seen for who they are, much beyond just a bunch of symptoms and a, and a label. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. We're hopefully going to talk a little bit more about community and what each one of us can take away from this conversation. Uh, um, but let me ask uh, Dr. Shekhar as well a little bit about your own personal journey. You have many identities, I'm discovering, um, uh, many avatars, um, many hats you wear. What actually drew you to this career, though, back in the day? Uh, I don't want to be a prophet of doom. Uh, a couple of years ago, Amit had uh, actually organized a meeting in Children First uh, called Imagine, and he'd invited Sanjay, the curator uh, of this festival, to speak. And I recall uh, Sanjay saying that uh, mental health is a ticking time bomb. Uh, and I have shamelessly proceeded to uh, quote him in several of these sessions that I have attended. Uh, when Amrita asked for a show of hands of how many of you have dealt with issues of distress in the recent past, and going back to the point that Amit made about uh, adverse childhood experiences, if COVID was a current pandemic, adverse childhood experiences has been an everlasting epidemic. And all of us, at some point of time in our childhood, have had experiences that were either distressing or where we felt devalued. Uh, but the major part, uh, Amrita, essentially was during medical school training, where uh, in, in my third year of medical school, when we started clinical work, uh, I realized how dehumanizing the practice of medicine is because you basically treat diseases, you don't treat human beings. And it was reflected in the dialectic 
and the language of the ward rounds, you know, which was, have you seen that gallbladder today or have you seen that ruptured appendix? Not the individual who had the gallbladder problem. And I realized that the only field where uh, you dealt with the sentience and the identity of a human being in all her struggles was in mental health and, and psychiatry. Uh, going into child psychiatry was a no-brainer uh, because the adult world terrifies and scares me. Uh, my own adulthood is a tremendous source of confusion and distress to me. I'm quite all right with children. And so the gravitation towards child mental health was a fairly logical. Uh, but I believe, uh, just relating the two as a final uh, kind of sense, that what happens in medical training, friends, is that many aspects of conveying bad news explaining complicated procedures, taking history from people who have Alzheimer's, taking history from children, taking history from people who have undergone trauma, are very difficult areas, and all this has to do with mental health. And therefore, the mental health context of uh, training and communication really becomes central to the practice of any form of medicine. And that really is, is the context uh, into coming into the whole arena of the mental health space. No, thank you so much. That's, that's fascinating. I think, you know, one thing I, um, I learned only very recently after setting up the Health Collective, maybe seven years ago, was that we all have mental health. And I think, you know, all of you here in the audience already know that because, you know, the fact that we're not sitting and talking in silos and um, we, we have a much more expanded vocabulary now. We're seeing a lot more in the mainstream about, mainstream media certainly, about mental health um, post the pandemic. I do want to ask um, uh, Dr. S uh, Dr. Shaker, Dr. Sen, and then Neha in that order, if you don't mind. What's changed post the pandemic when it comes to mental health? I mean, for example, what are you seeing more people come with? And we do know a source of anxiety is also, uh, do I have a problem? When do I know I have a problem? When should I come in? So I, I suppose, you know, when do you tell families, um, or what are you seeing families coming in with more and more? No, Amrita, what happened during the pandemic was, you know, because of the shrinking, of both internal and external ecologies, and particularly where children are concerned, where there was uh, loss of routine, loss of structure, loss of predictability, loss of social spaces, loss of peer interaction, loss of play. Um, the, there was the necessity to basically use the traction of the digital reality which already existed to really look at what was happening to uh, at that time, uh, we had actually started a national initiative on child protection uh, and mental health. Uh, the technical lead of the project is right here in the audience as well. Uh, and uh, we needed to use the digital technology to essentially reach people because uh, there was widespread issue of uh, a phenomena that's kind of a, for lack of a better term, a pan-diagnostic phenomena across anxiety and, and depression and all the rest of it. And that is intolerance of uncertainty. Mm. And in, intolerance of uncertainty uh, weighs very heavily on um, the, the well-being of, of people. So what has happened uh, is that the pandemic actually served in, 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 a, in a curious way to open out the whole discourse on, on mental health by enabling the digital medium to actually reach wider uh, and, and wider populations and communities which were hitherto not reached uh, because of the absence of um, this reach. And of course, the shame, silence, and stigma that in any case prevailed that uh, the anonymity that the digital world offered actually made it easier, therefore, to deal with the obstacles that were existing hitherto. So I think that's a major that's change that has occurred. That's interesting. So flatlining some of those hierarchies and barriers to access. Dr. Sen, what do you see more of nowadays and how do you see the pandemic having affected this? So, so to, um, uh, in, in our experience, uh, to summarize, uh, there were two um, major uh, learnings and fallouts. Um, perhaps if, 
there were things that we had known, but it became so apparent to uh, the larger community. One, of course, is what Shekhar talked about. I mean, we realized the importance of uh, rhythms and structures and institutions and what it provides for us in the form of scaffolding, both children and adults and families, and how the breakdown of all that, you know, had, um, had impacted the mental health of uh, young people and adults as well in ways that we have never known before. Mm -hmm. So there were four to five times increase in symptoms of anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. I've never seen so many um, young people dying by suicide as I did in, this, in, uh, in the last two to three years, substance misuse, all of that. So there's clearly been, been a deep impact. The other, th so uh, it, it goes to show that um, perhaps any one of us here or in the wider world is, has the uh, propensity or uh, you know, the chance of developing a, a, a mental illness, if you like to call it that. The other space that we worked in, it, at Children First, we opened up uh, our services, free services, to young people who had got stranded away from home. They were you know, in their late teens or early 20s, they were in college or had just taken up their first job, et cetera, and they could not go back home. And for the next six to eight months, they were completely isolated, no connection with friends or family. And um, dozens, hundreds of young kids actually approached us. And these uh, young people, we realized before uh, the COVID, COVID uh, hit us, were actually very well so-called adapted, successful people who had gone to the best of institutions, were successful in getting the uh, great pay package in the job they were in, and yet they developed all these, the range of symptoms that we talk about. And that goes to show how it's not just a, a cluster of people who can develop mental health problems, who we often end up othering and marginalizing, isn't it? I, I think this realization has dawned on the larger community, which is why the discourse about mental health has come into the wider world. And, and whether it is the state or the government or schools or colleges or NGOs, they're talking about mental health uh, with a lot more urgency. Also with the realization that if mental health gets affected, everything, everything else everything. does. And it also, you know, brings home that we're all vulnerable, right? Like there's no, there's none of us can actually sit here. Like I think some people had this idea that it's never going to affect me or my family, but we've just seen, right? I mean, Neha, um, to some of the work you've been doing, this, this, this move to sort of bridge those gaps and distances, how did the pandemic affect that? And then I'm going to do a quick follow up with you, starting with you on what's one thing you've learned is important to do on a daily basis. Yeah, so in the, in the pandemic, you know, the luxury to ignore oneself and one's realities and the challenges in one's relationships and, and other perhaps dependencies just went away, right? Uh, people found uh, that they, as they spent time in the, in the confines of their homes, uh, they were confronted with truths that maybe, you know, they had not had time to attend to. And so, in a sense, at a very lived experience level, and I think everyone in the room will sort of resonate with that. There are parents in the room who are talking about their children. Uh, there are children in the room who are wanting to get their parents in therapy. Uh, you know, everybody is here because we are all trying to figure out what is it that we need to unlock inside of us and around us, right? And so the pandemic gave us that gift in a way to say, here's the license. It's in every home. Everybody's talking about it. And you know, the path through grief is one of trying to seek recovery. And so we're seeing that in a massive way at Amaha. I mean, we're, we're reaching out to people across 600 cities. Uh, after COVID, we had a 30, 40% spike. We were entirely online. And as someone who was grieving the loss of my own brother, who passed away in the course of the pandemic, I just didn't know, you know where that purpose uh, and that uh, the, the daily productivity had to lie. And so for me also, I was battling with my own journey of being human and um, you know, to the point of self-help, recognizing that you know, it's not just about the things that you can do in the world outside, but the things that you need to be, to be feeling and doing within your own self, right? And, and so that journey of recognizing one's own truths, but then also combined with reaching out to others has, is really what that journey of Amaha has also been like. Yeah. And through the pandemic, we saw it just completely expo explored across the country. And it brought us together with Dr. Sen and Children First because we realized that a lot of young people actually you know, uh, struggle in their families. Yeah. And a lot of families struggle to bridge that care across the lifespan. And so then we came to Dr. Sen actually a few years ago. And together now, Children First and Amaha are able to support people across the lifespan. 
And so yeah. even if anybody in the family has a challenge, everyone can po possibly have some support and, yeah. and some solution. And I think, I mean, if there's a takeaway, I mean, uh, you know, I think a lot of times we feel we're going through something, it's, we internalize it. And I think in the Health Collective, we've shown that, you know, we do want you to know you're not alone. It's, you know, the more we have community, the more we have peer support, the better. I'm going to open for questions in a minute, but I do want to ask Neha. I just dropped something. <laughs> Damn. I dropped my phone. Thanks. <laughs> Dr. Sen is helping with my phone. Um, Neha, which is ringing, which is my cousin. Hello, cousin. Love you. Um, uh, Neha, Dr. Shaker, and Dr. Sen, before we open to the audience, um, one thing you do for yourself, for your own mental health, or one thing that your work has taught you is important. So you just touched upon it. Anything? Or am I putting you on I the spot? I think for me, no. I, th <laughs> I think for me, I've spent 20 years in the doing department, right? The human doing, validating, successing in the outside, achieving some success in the outside world, just to be able to uh, perhaps run away and cope with things. And I think what I started doing a lot more of thanks to my daughter and becoming a mother, is being and yeah. being spontaneous and being in the moment and reparenting myself. So nice. thank you to Ruhi and yeah, that's <laughs> thank really you, Ruhi. my call. <laughs> um, Dr. Sen, Dr. Shekhar. Um, so um, I, I think I've done different things at different times in my life to be able to, and sometimes quite spontaneously, something that's come naturally to me. But I think I have been more mindful, particularly after the pandemic, to figure out as to what it is it that, that actually helps me to remain grounded, to uh, address some of the angst that I probably bring home from the stories that I hear uh, with people I work. And uh, one of the things, of course, is connecting. Connect I, I've made a much more intentional decision to connect with members of my family, with old friends that I had lost connect with. That's one thing that I have been doing very mindfully indeed. And the other uh, go-to thing is, is cooking. So whenever I'm stressed out, I head straight to the kitchen. I, I come back from work and I just head to the kitchen. <laughs> and, and it's this multi-sensorial experience. And, and then also feeling cocooned and away from the rest of the world and its worries really helps that me helps. to unwind and to, and to heal, I think. Yeah. We'll come and visit you after you're stressed. That's clearly the tip from this panel. <laughs> Dr. Shekhar? Uh, one of the questions that I've often found difficult to answer is when people ask me, do you enjoy your work? Um, and I don't know wh what to say because what are you supposed to say? Ki kya must suicide ka case dekha, az maza gaya, you know, or kya first class depression dekha. Uh, and the truth is there have been days in which all I've felt like doing, uh, particularly when you deal um, with the underbelly uh, of the family, sometimes where uh, children experience uh, have experiences that devalue them. Uh, there are days where all I felt like doing is going home, uh, digging a hole and crawling into it. Uh, but the, the truth is that uh, many of us chose to enter into a certain profession uh, because we know the kind of challenges that come with it. And therefore, one doesn't have the luxury uh, to really meta-think this too yeah. much about and, and while uh, burnout uh, and tiredness and fatigue uh, does you know, take place, uh, it's a question of uh, how work is, is organized, uh, particularly your scale of work and the manner in which you approach it. But as um, the gentleman who did the introduction uh, said, uh, uh, my interest in music, and because I'm a trained and performing performing musician, uh, that acts as, as, as a counter sometimes to basically work as a buffer between times uh, that are intriguing, fatiguing, you know, uh, sure. tiring and, and challenging. Uh, but the obligations and responsibilities are enormous. And the reason for that, Amrita, is we believe in, in Samvad, the initiative that I'm running now, uh, which is a national initiative on child protection after I retired uh, two years ago from service uh, which, as per government regulations, is that for every child who manages to reach an expert service, there are 99 others who will never manage to reach you. But they are there, out there, in schools, in childcare institutions, in, in, in spaces of child labor and trafficking. And therefore, it was important to get into a robust public child mental health model, which is what we are trying to do now. Okay. And uh, if 
that um, the, the manner of the rollout of that service is efficiently calibrated, then it handles some of the challenges and tiredness that comes with. So it's, it's a, the, the, the other aspect of, of looking after the sense of, of, of tiredness is actually to work with systems in a way that you, you scale up and, and, and crank up your levels of efficiency of dealing with systems. Okay. That's fantastic. Uh, anyone who's been feeling triggered um, or feeling distressed, please know that help is available. We have listings on our website. There's Amaha, you heard. Um, so healthcollective.in slash contact. Some of our helplines are on Amaha's homepage. Um, and you know we do want this to be a safe space for you to ask your questions. Please don't share anything that's too confidential because this is being live streamed. And of course, you're in a public gathering. But now, finally, show of hands, who has questions? Where is the mic? OK, we have several questions. There we go. Uh, there's one, you want to start in the back? And then we move forward. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I work with an NGO called Slam Out Loud. We uh, are trying to take social emotional learning or life skills training to, uh, sc to schools and uh, yeah. to, sc to government schools. And um, through arts is, is what we're trying to do. And in fact, uh, we have, uh, my team is setting up a Bodha at India Art Fair this week as well. Uh, I'm trying to understand if our, um, the way we have assigned value to achievement over creativity in arts, um, how does that affect students in school? Like, um, from what I understand, what, what in my experience with children, um, they are not interested in pursuing arts unless they are good at it. Um, but we see arts as a medium of creative space, building life skills, right? So how much of a role does our, um, does our uh, assignment to achievement or assignment to productivity or hustle culture plays a role in a child's mental health journey? Uh, who wants to take that? Do you want to take that? Uh, so I have a couple of quick responses to that. I wrote a newspaper middle one. Please sit. I wrote a newspaper middle once where I said, rejoice, it's examination time. Funny, isn't it? No one ever thought of examinations as a joyous experience. There's always a sense of doom, disaster, and finality around it. Whereas examination should actually be a celebration of learning. It never is because success and outcome and performance is prioritized over process and effort. Uh, in fact, I remarked to a, a, a pal of mine who is a director of six schools, why don't you do an examination mela? Jaise yahan, uh, Sanjay ne hire kiya hai, you hire or stall laga do, itihas stall, uh, ganit stall. And as children enter, throw rose water on them and they go into these open books and he says, to be yaar, you know, my uh, team is never going to agree to this kind of stuff That Coming to the whole issue of arts, there are two issues here. One is arts-based therapies are a very robust way of engaging particularly in child mental health issues. And the reason for that is often children do not internalize trauma as language. It's internalized as sensations and, 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 and uh, visual cues. And therefore, arts-based approaches are exceedingly powerful in both eliciting experience as well as uh, it, E evoking th therapeutic transformation. The, the final uh, issue is that the amount of emphasis that is placed on the so-called livelihood and career-based options and trivializing art, and therefore the importance of arts in education is increasingly recognized now if you really look into the contours and the interstitials of NEP 2020 that arts is now being prioritized as, as a major that. My last comment is, what is the purpose of education? And people say literacy, numeracy, career, all of that. I have no uh, issues with any of that. But the true purpose of education is the development of an egalitarian personhood, the development of a socially responsive and responsible citizen, and the development of an identity that is imbued with aesthetic sensibility of art, music, theater, relationships, emotions, nature. And that's what makes a holistic uh, uh, human being, particularly where well-being is concerned. Yeah. Well said. So like, I think that answers the hustle culture bit as well. Dr. Yeah. Sen, you wanted to add something? No, I, and yeah. have no. Um, so 
Yeah, in, in fact, uh, I so resonate with all that you said and you put it so beautifully, Shekhar. Um, uh, all I wanted to add to what Shekhar said is that there are some organizations who have been working in this space um, where they provide emotionally safe spaces for different mediums of, uh, of expression, of sharing, of coming together as a community. And one of them that um, I have worked with for the last couple of decades and uh, of which uh, Sean Joy Roy, who's uh, uh, one of the uh, founders, organizers, uh, organizers of, of JLF, is a, um, is a founder trustee. Uh, so this, this organization working with street children has uh, incorporated in their, if you like to call it, developmental programs or curriculum, all kinds of um, art forms, sports, um, adventure, uh, in, in a bid to help young people find themselves. And I think that's one key thing that, and, and uh, of course, a lot of the, the work that is done in Salam Balak Trust in Delhi is actually up there on the net. So if you really want to uh, you know, have a look at it, uh, please do. You, there, there may be some. Or volunteer, and, he's saying. Or, or volunteer. Volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> volunteer or sign a check. Sign a check yeah. <laughs> Noted, Sanjoy. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So, uh, so, so, so yeah, um, uh, there are organizations who have worked towards this, and I think that it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, yeah. really impactful if you're able to get it right. Great question. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Okay. <laughs> I knew we should have do, uh, one on this side and then one on this side. Uh, one one question which is relevant in today's uh, uh, that, that uh, time that we're living in. What is the role of social media, positive or negative, in the kind of uh, mental health crisis that we are seeing nowadays? I am not answering that one, <laughs> okay, having worked at Twitter for five years. Uh, last week I met a gentleman who runs an organization called Yuva and he said, I asked him this question, uh, in the context of mental health and he said that the thing is that this generation is not, their childhood experiences are not geolocated, right? And so in a sense, their upbringing, the music they're listening to, the culture that they're relating or not relating to, the, the realm of exposure is, uh, is coming from all sorts of places and all sorts of medium. And so, and that has both positive and negative, you know, so the context of a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, the confusions around that, some of those questions are triggered. Access to information might be there in homes that are perhaps more reserved, more conservative, perhaps there isn't the open dialogue. We know uh, with a lot of the work that we do with the LGBTQ community, this is a real uh, uh, sort of opportunity to have open conversations. And so in that sense, there is a positive impact. Uh, but by far, I mean, when you look at the challenges around, um, you know, sort of multitasking, attention spans, uh, people's uh, relationship suffering, real world identities, right? Confusing your Instagram identity with your real self identity and, and what that means for your mental health and your relationship with yourself. Those are all the challenges that we're seeing. A lot of young people, I mean, Dr. Sen would speak to that, uh, coming in with severe challenges and parents coming in uh, with challenges around digital addiction and, and other harmful behaviors from gaming and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and I yet, I think also you, you have seen communities building online. I mean, where people have not had safe spaces at home, right. you find them finding um, um, allies and communities yeah. online. That's right. Yeah, in fact, that we, you know, even at Amaha, we have lots of communities that are specific for different things. So communities around addictions, communities around depression. So you can actually find people, like-minded people, who are going through similar journeys mm. of discovery. And that sharing of experience, strength, and hope really helps. So that is a positive that you can discover online. We've, yeah. had, we've actually Sorry. already had the f first uh, uh, metaverse uh, assault uh, stuff that's been in the, in the media recently. But I want to relate what you said to the question that came about socio-emotional uh, learning. It is just that forms of conflict resolution as we see depicted in various forms of social media, and I'm talking about the visual medium as well, not just social media that's used for communication, but you know, films and, and television and so on, and how conflict resolution is actually approached, and how do we help young people negotiate challenges in relationships and challenges with, with their own identity and, and expression therein and, and thereof. Uh, and this is what we attempt to do actually in socio-emotional learning and in schools and 
Uh, I remember Krishna Kumar, who was the chairperson of NCRT, once said that schools must be counter socializers. Uh, if media depicts men and women relationships in a certain way, then schools must challenge this, uh, these notions, and act as counter socializers. So I, I wanted to tell uh, uh, the, the person who spoke about social emotional skills also to have a look at our website, which is Nimhan's Child Protect dot in, which has a lot of issues on social emotional learning, but they are context based because context matters. You know, in which context do social uh, social emotional skills actually play out? Is it a relationship context? Is it a sexuality context? Uh, is it a conflict or a, a breakup of a relationship? And, and therefore, these interstitials of life skills and socio-emotional skills are very important to really address. Okay, uh, we can just get one last quick question in. So if you're going to have a quick question, uh, uh, the mic is behind. Okay, I think the, you took the initiative to stand up so you uh, get the this mic. This <laughs> uh, question is for both the doctors. I recently uh, came across a uh, Harvard scientist, Chris Palmer's long talk. His research says that there is a very strong link between these mental disorders and the gut health, the metabolic health. Gut health. Uh, have you come across any instance of this in your practice? Connection, Dr. Sen? Um, so, I mean, uh, into this notion that the mind and the body is separate uh, is uh, passe, <laughs> at least um, uh, over the years uh, in, um, um, in research, in the literature, and also in our, in our work, we realize that uh, you know, they, it's, a, it's a circular relationship between all, everything that's going on. And indeed, the gut is one very central system which uh, affects everything, really, from sleep to, uh, you know, your sense of well-being to the nutrition that you're getting and so on. So there are specific conditions. And of course, what happens uh, invariably if there is a mental health condition is that um, your appetite goes down, your eating patterns, uh, they go out of the window. Uh, we often hear parents... Um, complaining and really getting worried about the amount of junk food that uh, uh, kids uh, consume these days and so on. But there is, there is a specific category of uh, neurodevelopmental conditions where we see these things much more, uh, such as autism or perhaps uh, sensory integration difficulties often associated with ADHD. And these kids and, and the, what they consume and when they consume it often uh, affects their moods, it affects their um, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, their development, their learning, uh, their attention span, uh, and so on. So, uh, although, although these uh, connections and, and the relationships are still uh, not absolutely clear, but I think we are increasingly understanding that if we um, focus on gut health alongside other things, which is the thing to do in any case, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we take a holistic approach, then the outcomes in some children at least could be much better. Okay, we have time for those two quick questions. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask that how can we encourage someone to uh, go for therapy? Because in my experience, uh, when I ask people that uh, they, uh, therapy might help them, they basically uh, start fearing that they might get too codependent on th uh, therapy or uh, that they might be seen as too weak, that they need therapy. To I, that's a very good therapy. question. I'm sorry. So there's one in front of you and then this lady, and we'll try and cram this into... Um, yes. I noticed that when you talked about the things you do for yourselves, cooking, spontaneity, uh, music, you all smiled. Um, and I wondered how you can hold this kind of very difficult work and how you encourage us to hold this kind of urgent and difficult work with some lightness and levity. That's a lovely, two lovely questions and this lady has a final one, I guess. Will everyone remember, everyone pick one. <laughs> you have to... Okay, Yel, no. <laughs> Hi, yeah, my actual question is directly for Shekhar. I'm a palliative counselor from Tata Memorial Hospital. This is what's happening from one last year. Since five years I'm working and the cases are more, the people whom I have to announce their death, the treatment is stopping, is increasing. I come back home happy. So what is the narrative that I need to put it in my mind that doesn't make me sound serious to my own self? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, w one, how do we tell people, um, you know, encourage them to get help? Neha, that might be one for you. Are you okay to take that? How do we encourage people to take help? Because we do still feel that attitude of... Um, yeah, I think, and, and f with adults, it's, it's hard. Um, 
I think what I would say is that uh, one of the things that I've seen in journeys of care with family members, whether it's depression or, or schizophrenia or addiction, is uh, you have to walk that path, right? So by, by modeling uh, this ability to self-care, uh, to go, uh, you know, in the case of addictions, for example, to go for uh, a family's, you know, you have Al-Anon programs when you can have the alcoholic going to an AA program. So just modeling that idea of self-care and um, helping people see that, that, you know, you can take care of yourself and, and setting them on that path. Ultimately, insight and that inner calling is important. And so however you can sort of encourage that conversation to set off and then perhaps provide the tools and support so that as and when the person is ready, they're able to access what they need in the way that they need it and, and when they need it without feeling overwhelmed. Creation of safe spaces, I mean, these are some of the things. But yes, there's no one straight easy answer to how do you get somebody else to, to take go. charge of their life and their mental health. Um, I'll take the second, second question, question since the third yeah. one is specifically for Shekhar. Yes. So, uh, you know, in the work that we do with kids, uh, some of them who have uh, gone through extremely difficult and challenging life experiences, perhaps uh, different kinds of neglect and abuse, what we do bring in alongside that are also other aspects of fleshing out their lives, of what else brings pleasure, joy, or how did they resist, you know, uh, let's say the difficult circumstances. And, many, and in therapy or even when we are doing an assessment, we call it problem-free talk. And problem-free talk is also very important and central to the way we uh, connect with a, a child or a family. And, um, and that go goes a long way in uh, making the room, the atmosphere out there much more tolerable. Indeed, these are the conversations which, despite the difficulties in their lives, brings back hope and possibilities. And, and that's something that we do very consciously. It's a practice that we follow. Besides that, of course, uh, and of course, we, and, uh, especially with children, it's not very hard to get into spaces where you play, where you do art, you do music, uh, you know, uh, you, you, uh, uh, the, you know, the kid might c come and do a caricature of the teacher and all sorts of things. And, and we allow space for all that. Besides that, of course, I think that in our organization, what we uh, have, again, very consciously done is to celebrate uh, who we are, what we do, and uh, we celebrate uh, starting from birthdays to festivals to uh, milestones. Somebody's completed five years. Uh, we celebrate um, uh, festivals where we include the children and families and co-create those spaces together. And that brings a lot of lightness in the space. So generally speaking, and that's what most uh, families say, that when they step into children first, it's a happy, welcoming atmosphere. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that goes a long way in... Uh, not just he healing and helping children and families, but also healing us as therapists. Yeah. And part of reflective practice uh, is not just the reflexivity that comes in the client-therapist interaction, uh, but also uh, in the inner dialogue that the therapist has uh, with himself or her uh, herself, as the case may be. Now, this has two components, and since you spoke about uh, uh, cancer, uh, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm very fond of poetry, uh, and I always remember what Emily Dickinson uh, said when she says, uh, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, else every man be blind. Uh, now, uh, so the, the gentleness with which you, you actually approach a client who has gone through trauma or abuse or loss, and the reflexivity and gentleness with which you do your own inner reflection, combined with a debriefing process, which in many uh, good institutions is mandated. So even as a so-called senior practitioner, I would still have the space to debrief uh, some of the bottlenecks and challenges that I face with perhaps a peer group, uh, so that a lot of the issues that you speak about are resolved 
in the course of this interaction with the peer group. So these are two processes that go together to really mitigate any kind of angst or, or confusion that one may face, particularly in dealing with the kind of context that you have shared with us. Let's end by thanking all of you for your amazing questions, for your attention. Please take something from this conversation home and thank you to our awesome panel. Thank you all.